So the Kimi K2 thinking model recently dropped. And now I'm a few days behind in reporting on this. But there has been a few kind of new things emerging about this model that I think are important to mention. So you've probably seen the headlines. Kimi K2, it's an open source model out of China. They got the top score, state-of-the-art score on humanity's last exam. It's got the top score in a browse comp. It's outperforming models like Claude 4.5 Sonnet and GPT-5 in those areas. And it's looking really good across all the other scores as well. It executes up to 200 to 300 sequential tool calls without human interference. Excels in reasoning, agentic search, and coding, 256K context window. So we know all of that. Here's where it gets interesting. So first of all, notice it's saying a built as a thinking agent, K2 thinking marks our latest effort in a test time scaling, scaling both thinking tokens and tool calling churns. Now, Kimi K2 Thinking is basically a larger up scaled version of a DeepSeek R1. And there are a few noticeable differences. But the thing that really caught my attention here is when they're saying what they're experimenting with, and that is the test time scaling. Now, we, of course, saw this idea of test time scaling when OpenAI first introduced the O1 model. So we knew that the scaling laws have kind of continued when we we're talking about train time compute. So how long sort of hardware hours and GPUs that we throw at training the model before it's ready. So on pre-training the model, and of course the more compute it has, the better it is at, well, pretty much everything. So here they're using the AIME, which is a, a math exam, how accurate the model's uh, on that particular exam. So this concept certainly makes sense. The more compute, the more pre-trained compute, the better the model. Then the big deal with the O1 was its uh, reasoning abilities, right? It was able to reason about a problem right before answering it. And that ability to reason was called test time compute. So we gave it more hardware, more GPUs to burn some tokens thinking about it. And it's thinking about it at length produced better results. So you can see it here, again, the more tokens it uses, the more it thinks about it, the better the accuracy is. By the way, it's not just good at these specific tasks that they've cherry picked. It's also very good on other benchmarks that maybe are not as well known, maybe not as popular, but are very interesting as well. The EQ Bench 3 for creative writing. The Kimi K2 is at the top, so it takes the number one spot. So the various abilities that you have while writing across the board does very, very well. One thing I really like about the EQ bench is that they kind of track how similar certain models are to one another. Because we are able to tell which models are most like other models. So for example, some of the earlier iterations from DeepSeek were very much like some of the other OpenAI models. Later iterations of DeepSeek were more like Google Gemini. Now, what this probably means is that these models are sort of, they use a knowledge distillation from those models, right? So they take that data, the synthetic reasoning data, and they kind of create their own models with it. So in essence, what this means is that the U.S. builds some sort of an AI system, meaning one of the U.S. labs, OpenAI, Google, etc. The Chinese labs, they take this data, some of the knowledge, some of the results from this model, and they train another model that often is kind of similar to the predecessor on which it was trained. So for example, this one you see, it's very close to the other OpenAI models. Some of the other models, like the DeepSeek, the latest one, is gonna be much, much closer to Gemini. The reality is there's a lot of innovation that's happening over there, but it, it does seem like the data, like a lot of it is based on US findings, US models, right? And so, and they just open source that model. So that means that the U.S. labs are spending tons and tons of money building those models, and they're hoping to get some ROI on those models, some return on their money. The Chinese labs open source something that's similar, in this case, in many ways, even better for much cheaper. How much more? Let's take a look. According to the CNBC, the Alibaba-backed Moonshot releases its second AI update in four months as China's AI race heats up. And as you can see here, they're saying that the new Kimi AI model cost just $4.6 million to train. Now it's important to understand that if we can trust those numbers, that doesn't mean that any old lab can just make a model of this quality for 4.6 million. There's tons of other costs that go into it before it. You have to have a lab, you have to have some infrastructure already in place, but the cost of training that particular model is just under 5 million. So what does this mean? Well, let's say the current state of the art on some super important test is 30%. That's the best of the best. One AI lab creates a lot of innovations and it gets that to 40%, a massive jump. It costs them a lot of money. Money, innovation, data, et cetera, tons of GPUs, infrastructure, et cetera. And let's say there are several other labs that were sitting around 30%. For them to catch up is cheap. 
it does not cost a lot of money for them to catch up. So once one person hits one level, the, 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 the followers, it's easier and cheaper and faster for them to catch up. And that's what we've been seeing with all the AI labs and with DeepSeek being able to catch up quickly for not a lot of money and just to put out there a cheap version, an open source version of whatever the best state of the art model is. That's exactly what Kimi K2 did here with a little twist. One thing you'll notice that everyone says that's using in this model, and I've noticed it as well, is that it produces a lot of tokens for its thinking. So in other words, it's test time compute. It just burns through a lot of tokens, even for fairly minor use cases. So meaning it's not here, it kind of walks itself up this line. So it uses more tokens and more compute to provide better answers. So according to this CNBC article, DeepSeek also claimed it spent 5.6 million for its V3 model in contrast to the billions spent by OpenAI. So, I mean, this is a nonsense. This is not true. I can't believe they would write this because here they're saying that DeepSeek spent this amount for one model. And then they're saying in contrast to billions. So OpenAI did not spend billions on any given model. By the way, this is the article at the length that OpenAI expects to burn billions through some year in the future. That has nothing to do with how much it costs them to train one model. Now, it probably costs a lot more than this, you know, tens of millions, but certainly not billions. So why are the Chinese companies doing this? Well, there's a few reasons. First, it makes it that there's less money for U.S. labs. If you're the only model in town, you can charge whatever price you want. If you have a multiple closed source labs, then, you know, you're competing with each other, but prices are higher. If you have a few models that are just as good and open source and available and very inexpensive, well, that kind of like gives the next best alternative. Do you pay for something that's much more expensive or you just switch over to the cheaper open source model? That really puts a downward pressure on the prices. It also, of course, ensures that the Chinese open source models are getting used in parts of the world that cannot pay the high prices of the Western labs. This makes sure that the global AI infrastructure is built on Chinese models, not US-based ones. And of course, since China has a manufacturing advantage of building the hardware, the robots, the trinkets, the, like, the physical goods, and US generally has had a software advantage, right? Building the, the software, the digital infrastructures, etc. By taking the wind out of like the software, the AI, the digital side of it, China still has its advantage in the physical manufacturing side. One other very interesting thing that I've been hearing recently, and this is coming from a lot of people that know how things inside of China work. We have an interview with a very interesting expert coming soon to the channel, but this is apparently kind of open knowledge in how the leadership of China works. And that is that a lot of the scientific discoveries, they're sort of secret by default, especially when it comes to sensitive technologies like tech, warfare, AI, stuff like that. So it's not like they just get published in all the newspapers and everyone is free to talk about them. They usually don't get published out there. So they're known internally, but not on a worldwide global press. Whereas in the US, a lot of stuff gets published and spread around, etc. So it seems like China often releases their findings up to a certain point when they see that the Western media is talking about the fact that it's been discovered on the sort of on the Western side and made its way to the newspapers. So let's say some U.S. lab figures out how to improve some technology by 25%. Like it's published in the papers. Everybody's talking about it going, hooray, we did it. At this point, the Chinese side, if they have already done the same research and already got to 25% or more, right? So up to 25%, that gets sort of unclassified and they go, okay, publish the paper that shows that we're able to do the same thing. So in other words, they're only willing to admit they have knowledge only when the sort of a Western side, the Western media shows that, okay, we have this and we're willing to publish it. That means that in a race where U.S. and China is neck to neck, let's say U.S. figures out how to get up here, then China will publish what they have showing that they're also up here. Again, they are, they're publishing true information. The point isn't that they're just saying they are. The point is they'll never publish something that shows that they're way ahead because that might allow everyone else to reverse engineer that technology or realize that, oh, there's this possible approach to, to get that effectiveness, et cetera. And we're literally seeing that the same exact dynamics play out here. Every time a U.S. labs hits a new high, China comes out very soon, months after, with a model that's right around there. Usually it was just a little bit less. Here with the Kimi K2, it's just a little bit more, probably because they, they ramped up that test time compute. But it's likely that we're going to keep seeing this. Every big win on the U.S. slash Western side will be met with a equal increase in capability on the Chinese side, often much cheaper and with a lot less hardware requirements. 
So I think there's a two kind of big takeaways here. One is that no one is likely to win by a mile, let's say. In this AI race, it's unlikely that somebody's going to pull away ahead and stay there. If you've ever played Mario Kart, there was these catch-up mechanics to where if somebody's in last place, they have certain benefits and game-based features that kind of make it more likely that they'll catch up. The person at the front gets a slight penalties, you could say, and the person at the back gets slight advantages so that you can always kind of catch up. You might set the race miles ahead, but by the middle, by the end, that could change rapidly. So that means that the AI race is kind of like Mario Kart. That's point number one. And point number two, we may not know what the Chinese labs are actually working on because they might not be publishing in their actual research unless the Western side already published something at least as good. Now, I'm not necessarily saying they have something, just I don't know if we would necessarily know. Anyways, those are my two cents on the Kimi K2 model release. Let me know what you thought about it. If you made this far, thank you for watching. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you in the next one.